share my whole screen. That's, and then I can go full. Because, yeah, that's the only way I know how to do this. It means that if you want to ask me a question, which you probably should feel free to do, um, then you should just unmute yourself and shout, because otherwise I won't see you. Um, okay, now I can start talking, if, if this works. Um, can you see the whole slide now? Yeah, we see the whole slide. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how this talk is going to go. It's a little bit challenging for me. Uh, my brain isn't working very well today. But even if it wasn't for that, um, I wrote this paper for the workshop and I wasn't very happy with it. It was all a bit of a mess. And I think the talk is the same, but uh, maybe it'll be an interesting mess. So um, here's a picture of a uh, programming language. Uh, well, there's a picture, there's a programming language on this slide. Uh, and um, this is a still from, uh, if you're not familiar, and um, one of the, the sort of themes is, is that the, the Goblin King is uh, both tormenting and, and seducing uh, this uh, poor uh, young girl. And um, that's how I see programming languages really, is that they, they, they promise a lot, but in return, you, they, um, you have to let them rule you. So there's a lot of domination going on. So that's the sort of counterpoint to what I think we want to have, which is a, uh, convivial tools where, where the, the person who is trying to use the tool to their own ends is really the one who is uh, setting the, the, the tone. So that's a very sort of high level um, analogy. Um, one of the things about software is that we have a lot of culture and our culture comes with a lot of sort of beliefs or, or what I call design heuristics about how, how we should do things, what are good ways of doing things, and that it extends to, you know, what is a good programming language design, or what's a good way to build a system. Uh, and as a result of these beliefs, these ideas being put into practice, uh, software and our infrastructure grow in, in certain ways. And some of these heuristics that I might identify are things like, well, all else being equal, you might want to use a higher level programming language. We have this idea of information hiding that says, yeah, you want to have modules and you'll have interfaces and you put the stuff that is believed to be change prone inside inside the module but not in the interface and that's information hiding or you have things like well it's good for your code to be portable so let's you know try and identify a, a small a small subset of dependencies if you like and then code against those and then um, that would be sort of a long-term good for your, for your program things like maximizing compositionality and also following examples we have a lot of examples i think people are, are very much drawn to examples a lot of people will build a new system by basically copying an, an old system that they became familiar with, but maybe wanted to, to modify in some way. So there's a lot of examples feeding this culture. And, and the culture comes from lots of places, right? It's some, of, some of these design heuristics are things that have been explored in academic research to, to greater or lesser extent. So things like you know, information hiding or the design of high level languages, they, they, they have that sort of lineage. Um, and then there's sort of a spectrum of sort of more popular sources going right the way down to just you know stuff people say to each other it's like oh yeah that's probably a good idea or you know uh, the, the folklore is, is much more much broader than, than what is in the literature um, so one of the the themes of conviviality i suppose is that you can have ideas that seem good ideas at the time and then when you when you let them run riot you let them you let your culture put them into practice at a large scale you find that uh, things didn't quite go as, as you planned. So, so this is one of the pictures I like to use for that, which is obviously a very good freeway in early 1970s. I uh, can't remember where it is anyway, somewhere in the US, as you might guess. Um, so people had this idea that wouldn't it be great if everyone had this you know, very fast personal transportation available to them, and we can you know, put them into practice across the whole of our society, and you find that, well, things didn't work out very well. So um, this was a theme, this sort of counterproductivity if you like, this idea that, well, you seem to have this powerful tool, but um, when you follow through to the consequences across the whole of society, you find that uh, it doesn't actually work very well. So this was one of the sort of core themes of Illich's writing in the 70s, uh, and as well as uh, uh, motorized transportation, he also critiqued uh, modern medicine uh, with this particular sort of blast, where he said a few patients survive longer with the transplant of various organs, so there's a very sort of high technology aspect of medicine. But on the other hand, 
there was a, a, an overbearing social cost exacted by medicine, which was very hard to measure. You can also point at people who survived an organ transplant, but how do you measure the what he called the illusion, illusion, social control, prolonged suffering, loneliness, genetic generation, and frustration produced by medical treatment, or in another part of the text, he described it as something like uh, surviving in an unhealthy society. Um, so that's this theme of good ideas going bad. Things that, things that seem like they're good ideas might actually not turn out to be such good ideas when we put them into practice over uh, a large span of time or space. And it's my belief, again, a belief that I'm struggling so far really failing to to nail to really justify strongly uh, but it's still my belief that the conventional design heuristics of programming languages and systems have proven uncon unconvivial they've they've left us in this sort of freeway style congested unhealthy sort of uh, environment where uh, each individual is 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 apart from a very few are basically disempowered by the technology um, so i'm trying to Get my head around what might be better heuristics if we revisit all those bits of wisdom and folklore um, that, that come to us um, from these various sources what could we do uh, how could we invent new pieces of wisdom that would somehow change the eventual outcome uh, and one of the themes of course is to lessen this idea of dominance so we we don't want the the david bowie style of uh, uh goblin king uh, sub um um, I told you my brain wasn't working very well. Anyway, we don't want to be subject to, to Goblin Kings and uh, similar um, dominators, even if we have to give up some power uh, in the process. Um, there's a second prong to this line of thinking, which is, well, even if we've got some good ideas about how alternatively software could be uh, built, our infrastructure could be designed to build it that way, well, how would we get those into the the social um, media, how would we get them established um, in the practice of, of people? Um, so the way Illich liked to talk about that was to say, well, uh, it's something about inverting the structure of tools. It's quite nice a nice um, way of put, putting it, where we want people's tools to be once to guarantee their right to work with independent efficiency, eliminating the need for slaves or masters people need tools to work with rather than tools that work for them. That was the nice idea that failed. Um, so this, this talk and this work is really still at the stage of what, I, what I'm calling oblique strategies, which if you don't know them, they're these sort of little flashcards that were devised by Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt when they were in, the, in creative ruts. They wrote down these little very obscure and not very clear, uh, not very clearly defined sort of phrases that would help them break their creative deadlock if you like and they were deliberately uh, not very precise so they would say things like remember those quiet evenings if you put that thought in front of you you might suddenly think of a different way of doing things that would break the deadlock so so that's still unfortunately the, the primitive state of this work at the moment i have a handful of uh, oblique strategies that i can't fully defend so i'm going to talk about three different technical measures um, and one is just saying on this theme of, of taking over the world. Um, I've recently been playing this adventure game, Day of the Tentacle, only 26 years too late. Um, so um, uh, it's really uh, baked into the idea of um, how we design our infrastructure that, that, that what we design to gain its full utility uh, should be somehow uh, acquiring world domination or, or something a bit like that so the idea that well if i'm a programming language designer then what i really want is for my language to be the language that takes over the whole world uh, and everyone uses and, and that's how i know that i've done something right so of course i believe that's a structure we desperately need to, to invert um i don't think it's healthy to have uh, our our technology factored into multiple uh sort of competing languages that are each trying to take over the world but are not predicated on the idea that oh actually uh, maybe I'm gonna have to coexist with these other people uh, one of the this is obviously a, this is a theme that if you read any of my other work you will have known that I've been uh, saying this for ages and I feel a bit silly how often I end up repeating it but um, this idea that well code is somehow um, belongs to a language and so if you want to take over the world one of the problems you have with your programming language is to bootstrap the whole ecosystem of libraries you need 
need thousands of people to spend, each spend thousands of hours writing a new version of the most boring library imaginable because, well, the libraries are inside the language. So uh, you can't use whatever libraries people have written. You need, you need a new library because you've got a new language. Um, and this doesn't even, this doesn't even stick with the libraries and even things like uh, parser generators. I find this it's kind of hilarious that the whole point of a parser generator is I don't ever want to look at the code that comes out with that parser generator. So what language it's in should really be irrelevant. And yet the parser generator I have to use is entirely dependent on what programming language I'm using it uh, from, using the generated code from. So it's another example of how we're, we're stuck with, with this sort of assumption that languages are, are there to dominate uh, the world. Um, so how could we invert this structure? How could we take this completely to the opposite extreme? This is actually a thought experiment I've been doing just recently. Um, uh, what to say about that? Um, so, so what if we designed a language on the assumption that we had no library within that language? And the only thing that language could do was talk to stuff that already uh, existed. Uh, and obviously I'm, I'm picking on the example of libraries, but all other sort of elements of the programming experience that, that uh, normally sit within or often conceived as sitting within a particular language, like tools for debugging or nowadays even things like package management. Um, if, we, if we completely invert that and say, what happens if we assume that we can only work with an outside instance of that thing, then we end up with, with some quite different designs. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not going into specifics. This is the oblique, obliqueness coming out again. Um, but uh, I, I seem to be, as I follow this line of thinking further, I am ending up more thinking along the lines of what I was doing in my PhD those many years ago, which was this cake language that other people like uh, Antronik has uh, mentioned already. So, so there's something about a language that, whose whole job is to recover structure from the outside rather than defining structure uh, inside. Um, it's an interesting angle that I, we all, both me and, and others, need to think more about. Uh, so, okay, so, so onto my second of these oblique, oblique strategies. Um, it's this idea of, of valuing linking over containment. So, so we can think about uh, hierarchies. We like to think about hierarchies. Hierarchies are everywhere in software. Um, and you can see this pretty direct visualization of the library issue that I was just talking about, the library being contained within, logically within, the language that is, that is hosting it. Uh, and uh, some very wise people have thought before about how hierarchies are only one possible organizational structure and actually there's a trend in software to move from the hierarchical to the heterarchical, something that's more like a graph, more, more sort of unconstrained. This picture is actually from a textbook by Robin Milner, um, one of the last things that he did before he died. And I, I was sure that I got this, I'd learned this word heterarchy from this book. Turns out I didn't, because um, I looked at the book and it doesn't actually say heterarchy. Anyway, um, what do I want to say about linking it? Um, oops. Um, so we have this widespread preference for hierarchical abstraction. Um, it's very appealing for lots of reasons, mathematically, uh, also so bureaucracies love hierarchy. Um, so it's, it's convenient, basically chopping things up and then chopping the things up again and so on. Um, it's a, it's a, an obvious way, it's an obvious tool to use to attack complexity. Um, but I think most of us will be familiar with lots of ways in which that is uh, limiting uh, in terms of what it lets you express. And also if we think more in more Illichian terms, we might think about how it goes bad if we apply it uh, on a wide scale. Um, so, so for example, uh, if you force things into a hierarchy, you end up with replicated structures where you say, well, you've got to be under this or under that, under there, then you might get a copy uh, in all of those places. You might get somehow uh, entities being multiplied as Occam, as Occam's razor would put it. Um, so an example would be, you know, if you have a file system without siblings, maybe you, you, the way you'll deal with wanting a file to be here and there is to make a copy of that file, which obviously increases the complexity that you have to deal with. Suddenly you have more things to worry about. Uh, it's the library example again um, that we can see here where libraries are sitting under a particular language. And it's also the things that Marcel was talking about, or maybe it's things I was talking about that I was thinking Marcel was talking about uh, yesterday uh, in terms of this idea of there being many copies of a piece of state, suddenly you have this problem of replicating it. So can we instead uh, build systems that are better at interreference uh, and don't rely so heavily on containment? So a way of thinking about that might be to say, well, imagine you had 
some kind of programming environment that did not have a way to model or has a relationship, whatever that means in a particular context, but it could do a refers to a thing, it could do a cross link rather than an embedding or a containment. And if you follow that design, you end up with, uh, I think, a much more, much stronger imperative to, to have an, a strong abstraction of naming, uh, name being just an encoded reference. So um, putting names sort of higher up in your design is something that that, that strategy would, would lead you to doing. Uh, it's again, there's, there's no science to this. It's, it's even just a feeling at the moment that, that if you design a system around uh, linking within a shared namespace, you get something that it's more convivial. Uh, one reason why that might be is that we do avoid replication. We do promote parsimony and minimalism. I don't know whether that's the only reason. Um, whereas if we design around an ownership domain uh, and sort of we end up building deep hierarchies that are sort of each one is gambling, each part of the hierarchy gambling on dominating the others, so it promotes kind of replication. So my third uh, strategy, if you like, or heuristic, whatever you want to call them, um, is uh, something about portability, because we talk a lot about portability in programming discourse, and uh, it's always bothered me a little bit, because to my mind, uh, a portable specification is a very different beast to a portable chunk of implementation. So if I say, you know, something like, oh, I, uh, I want to I wanna say what it means to be, uh, uh, to be a, a Java virtual machine, let's say I can write a specification that's kind of useful because there, it means that suddenly there are many possible artifacts, each of which can be used as if it were a Java virtual machine, but it may have different properties in other respects. It may have uh, its your own unique strengths and weaknesses and so on. Um, whereas if I have a chunk of code and I say this code is portable, uh, and again, this could simply be a JVM, I could say, well, I've got this big monolithic blob of stuff that is made portable by um, assuming a sort of fixed minimal lowest common denominator sort of window to the outside world and then containing a huge amount of complexity because that's one of the key techniques of making software portable to say well anything that I can't assume but definite is available to me from the outside I'm going to re-implement uh, internally so I have this multiplication entities um, problem uh, and more generally we can think about um, the tendency of, of portable code to spawn off a new, yet another model of a particular domain or yet another interface. Um, it's uh, uh, nevertheless a heuristic that we pursue a lot. This sort of gets a lot of uh, cultural um, presence in terms of how we build software. So, so one little uh, sort of thing, I, I only thought about this recently, which is how many layers of window management are there on your desktop right now in terms of, you know, oh, uh, well, I've got a window manager, but then I've got my web browser and that's got its own kind of tabbing system that's kind of like its own window manager. And then I'm running a web page and oh, that's got its own window management in sort of the DOM level. And, and uh, okay, that's probably the end of that, that sequence. But you, you, you see the idea that these have sort of, each one of those has risen up, I would say largely because of, of the need to be, uh, of, to be portable. So HTML with respect to different browsers and so on. Uh, and um, within the browser because, well, um, it was either not possible or too difficult to, to uh, acquire a tabbing feature just by interacting with the window manager. So um, what's the opposite of being portable? Well, I'm calling it being porous, um, which means somehow about not trying to build a sealed unit on top, some, on top of some common denominator, but somehow working with what you find, letting the, the, the bedrock uh, influence what, what you build on top, uh, which is it, again uh, a very tricky feat. Uh, it's something that our current infrastructure is not at all good at, but something that uh, we can maybe think of building infrastructure that is much better at. Again, I find myself uh, drawn back to my PhD work on this. Um, but a, a very much simpler example would be something like um, print print user interfaces. Often think about how uh, some point, maybe 15 years, uh, maybe 20 years ago, some time ago, a long time ago, uh, when the uh, on Linux, the GTK uh, widget toolkit was sort of getting a lot of investment, a lot of developers working on it, and it suddenly acquired this new kind of print dialogue, which is absolutely disaster because it didn't know, it, it, it 
it relied on a unified model of printing such that it would you know you had to choose it gave you this nice uniform way of choosing all your print options and then it would try and encode them so as to send them to the printer whereas previously it just uh, programs would have to you know, generate some postscript and sort of hope for the best so, so work with a much narrower interface but because uh, it could only model the things that had been anticipated and print as a pretty diverse domain it was trying to build this grand unifying abstraction on top of some uh, uh, common denominator and it it was um, basically a very uh, a very flawed concept it was constantly lagging the features that were available in the environment because the environment was this thing that it was uh, pretty much by definition um, only relying on a very small subset of so um, that's a somewhat incoherent rant about printing I think I'll stop there but one of the interesting things I wanted to mention it took me a long time to get my head around I, I do a lot of uh, C programming and so on and uh, you download some of C code and you run this configure script. And when I was sort of getting into this line of programming, it took me a long time to figure out what, what on earth is it doing? Does it really have to probe for whether you've got this header or that header or what the maximum number of arguments is to your program and so on? And it took me years before I clicked that it's it's kind of a first step on this path, right? Because it's, it's saying, well, there is no grand version numbering scheme for Unix-like en environments interfaces. Instead, it has to have this whole repertoire of dimensions on which it can probe the environment it says does it do this if I poke it like this does it do this poke it like this and then it gives you that in programmatic form it doesn't do any fancy automatic adaptation so it's maybe not quite as fancy as we would like in terms of relieving the programmer of the burden but at least gives you some kind of then you get a pile of standard macros you can use to test do I have this feature or not do I have to work around this or not so that's an interesting not so shiny example because it's so horribly crafty but it's it's an interesting example of uh, basically a somewhat porous way of dealing tools for dealing with a sort of porous approach um, to uh, to somewhat varying interfaces okay i think i've finished my uh there's a bit more in the paper i won't promise they make any more sense but um uh that's the end of my strategies for the technical side of things but i thought it was worth briefly talking about the the more social side of things which is to say suppose we come up with great ways of building our infrastructure then maybe they will still not actually uh, gain much traction, right? Maybe the dark side is is still stronger, as Luke would ask uh, Yoda. Of course, Yoda says no. Uh, quicker, easier, more seductive. Quicker to join you in a fight, but not stronger. Um, so how can we ensure that this the convivial light side prevails, given that pretty much by definition, it is slower, more difficult, or less seductive than um, the sort of aircraft carriers uh, approach. Um, well, there is a tragedy to this, which is, again, something that Illich observed that uh, uh, there's a cycle of dependency, uh, which, which becomes very hard to break. Um, if we, as a society, become dependent on overpowerful tools, we get locked into certain patterns of existence, whether that be getting around by powerful transport to be dependent in an unhealthy environment. Um, just sort of notice saying my high CPU usage is affecting the meeting quality. I try to use my CPU for that. Um, and then uh, this, this is exactly the notion of radical monopoly, the idea that a particular way of doing things can become exclusive in the sense that if you want to participate in a society, well, you better have powerful transportation because everything is designed uh, around that. Uh, you can't opt out of that. Uh, that's why it's a monopoly. So um, I think that we need to think not only in terms of technical measures but also in social measures about what it means to be a healthy movement or culture or even tribe that's probably not a great word to use but um but if we think about this human's propensity to to, to want to feel attached to movements uh I, I tend to see that as the evolutionary means of inducing uh capacity for individuals to sacrifice to the greater good so, and that's you know any movement or, or culture will have its sort of its norms and its taboos um, and there are things that I think a, a community will have to develop if it is to sort of acquire buy-in from a useful number of people. Um, I feel there's a, there's a sort of paradox here, which is why do we want to acquire buy-in when we don't want to dominate people? Are they, are they in conflict or not? I'll, I'll leave that for the discussion, I think. Um, but in general, we can say this is a form of fighting fire with fire. That's a phrase I borrowed from Stallman, uh, Richard Stallman, of course. So. Um, I think that if you look at the GPL and how Stallman talks about the, the, the GNU general public license, it's very Illichian in its, its language. It's saying that 
we want freedom, but not to take away others' freedom. Um, so that's more or less something that that Rich said, or not exactly verbatim, but but very close. Um, so it's very vulnerable to to bad outcomes, right? That's something we've observed with the free software uh, movement recently. Uh, one of the ways in which it goes wrong is that although a project might be nominally free, it might be impossible for people, ordinary people who don't have huge resources to, to contribute to that. Uh, so we need to think about other ways of differentiating, other ways of telling what might characterize a project or an infrastructure that is convivial according to our own uh, values. So it might be that it's somehow learnable, that it has a slow rate of internal change. That's normally considered a bad thing. Like a slow rate of change means, oh, this project's kind of almost dead, but I personally think it's, it's actually can be a healthy sign. Uh, whether it respects its its users and its communities, that's something that uh, actually, I actually think Linus Torvalds, all his uh, ranting and raving, is uh, is very good at saying we respect the user code and we don't want to break uh, user land. Many projects take completely the opposite uh, view. They say no, we dominate we dominate users and uh, they have to follow what we say. Um, I'm almost at the end of my talk. I can't even remember if I oh I did write a last slide. Uh, which is just to recap this idea that all disciplines have their dogmas and both the sort of latter part of the talk and also the, the first part with the technical heuristics, you can think of as dogmas, which might be a harmful thing, might be like, well, uh, maybe people mindlessly following dogmas is, is just always a bad idea. But um, I think um, it's, a, it's probably a good tactic to try and think of what new dogmas we might need. Um, I think we all agree that we need new ones. Uh, maybe what I've just talked about is some help in figuring all this out. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Stephen. That was amazing. Um, so I think, Jonathan, you're our respondent, is that right? <clears throat> yes, I am. Awesome. Uh, you take Stephen, it. could you try muting and see if that's where the wine's coming from? Yes, just as I suspected. All right, let's see if I can, um, do the screen sharing thing. Okay, is this working? Yeah, looks great. Okay. Well, thanks, Stephen. That was um, this is very hard for a, to respond to something that I'm in, in violent agreement with. And um, I think he's, uh, Stephen has shown us many ways in which unconviviality is endemic throughout our practice and that the causes of this are deeply rooted and they're, they're deeply rooted in both our society, our institutions and ourselves. And we don't really have a cure or even a clear path to one. We're, we're struggling to find our way forward. And I, and on paper, I, uh, it's just very well said. I really have to recommend everybody to read the paper, which um, is is very eloquent. And um, there's there's a month worth of tweets in there. And I won't um, I won't slow down by by quoting from it. And it and, and it goes into much more detail than the, the presentation did. And in fact, I'm going to respond to the paper rather than the presentation. And however, um, some of of the ideas presented there triggered my my PTSD. You know, post traumatic software disorder. So. This, this may be a somewhat personal response, but I hope that there is some value to others. So one thing that Stephen says is that we should value linking over containment. And yes, I, I entirely agree with the intuition and, and the sentiment, but this is again, one of those ideas that if taken too far can have negative consequences. So, and I've seen this movie before. Does anybody remember Korba? overthrow the evil monolith with distributed objects, tear down your monolith. This did not have a happy ending. Then there was the sequel, microservices, overthrow the evil monolith with REST APIs. I, I understand that Uber has over 3000 microservices. And I'm just starting to see comments on Hacker News about people 
moving away from microservices to monoliths again. So, you know, the cycle is turning yet again. And just as Mark said, history does repeat itself. You know, the first time is tragedy and the second is farce. The problem is, is monoliths actually work? They work really well. And it turns out that moving the spaghetti from your code into the network architecture is not a win. It's easier to refactor a monolith. You have entire systems, microservice systems, which are sort of like a Java class inside the monolith. So we, we've built a lot of complexity. So when we go, when we divide things up into small pieces and, and link instead of contain, we're, we're adding a lot of complexity. So, of course, I'm not being entirely fair here. Uh, Stephen isn't really advocating this sort of senseless division and linking as, as an ideology. But I think we should be careful of this idea because it doesn't always work out as it's intended, particularly when the thought leaders get a hold of it. Uh, another one of, of the uh, heuristics is to construct views specifying new ways to refer to already extant definitions. And, and this occurs in the paper and in, in several contexts. Um, and, and this is an intuition I share very much uh, with a distinguished tradition. We have updatable database views and lenses. We have AOP, SOP, I mean SOP, COP, and FOP, which were all sort of various takes on that idea. Does anybody recall hyperslices, the, the, the tyranny of the dominant decomposition? A wonderful slogan. But unfortunately, all of these slogans and intuitions, you know, in practice, when you actually work them out, they were really underwhelming, right? These are not satisfactory solutions. And I consider this to be an open problem. It's a high hanging research problem. And we could have a whole nother rant about why high hanging research problems don't really seem to be getting addressed very well in computer science, but it's still a very open problem. And I think um, I encourage us all to continue to work on it. Do not create worlds. At or near the origin of the universe, creating new worlds is a necessary activity. But when existing matter is plentiful, it is either a futile gesture or a bid for domination. Wonderful prose. But I ask, what if we are still near the origin of the universe, in fact? What if all the programmers alive today are only 5% of all the programmers over the next 50 years? It could very well be that we are still near the beginning and that building new worlds could be of use. But I don't actually see people building a lot of new worlds. What I see is a lot of layers being agglomerated onto this old world. And personally, I'd, I'd, I'd rather see some new worlds. I'd rather see, back in the 80s, we talked about paradigms a lot. And I don't hear that talk so much anymore. In the real world, though, what examples can we see of convivial computing? Well, there's things like, you know, the good old 80s microprocessor, basic and Pascal systems, spreadsheets, hypercard, lab view, scratch. These are the, the, the standard examples we all call upon to say, this is sort of what we're getting at, what we'd like computing to be more like. But these are all self-contained worlds. So I have to ask, is general purpose convivial computing actually possible? I, we haven't really seen too many examples of it yet. And in fact, does conviviality demand sacrifice and retreat? It cannot be the mainstream. And I, I suspect from my reading that Ivan Illich might say yes, that there is sacrifice and retreat required for conviviality. But I think this is a to me, um, a, a deep question that I hadn't thought really seriously about until reading Stephen's paper. So I, I really recommend that you do read it. It, it. It's fairly courageously raising some troubling issues without really having good solutions, which is, is asking for critique. 
but it, it gave me a lot to think about. So thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. That was awesome. So uh, questions. Okay, so my my mouse has disappeared, and how do I stop sharing? <laughs> I have my mouse cursor. Has... This is like. Can you like turn it off on me? I really I don't have a mouse cursor anymore. Uh, yeah, I had the same problem at first. Let's see. Can I stop? This right, one's on tabbing. Yeah, it's just completely gone. Or escape. I think I got it. You got it. No, I didn't. You've stopped sharing. Did I? Ah, okay. All right. I had to leave full screen. So I think it's time for questions. Um, there is one in chat by uh, by Tom during the talk. Oh, great. Um, is that the are airline programs uh, of communicating processes considered monoliths? Oh, so, so that's um, a question to me. Wait, what was the question again? Uh, are airline programs of communicating processes considered monoliths? My context is Jonathan saying monoliths work and microservices don't. Ah. Um, I think Erlang does work. It does seem to, to work fairly well. So it's an example of, of getting message passing to work um, in practice. Of course, I think it's still the way it's implemented, right? Is it still a monolith? It just runs in a single, single Unix system, right? And it's, it's still essentially an entire program. And so you don't solve all those problems of, of all the you know, independent paths of evolution that people like from microservices. Thanks. But certainly Erlang is my, my preferred approach to the problem rather than microservices. Cool, so I've got Gary and then Antoneg and then Pavel. Uh, so Gary, go ahead. Um, I, I think my hand was probably set up from the last talk. Oh, okay, cool. I'll, I'll lower it for you. And Anthony, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to say I always love so much listening to talks by Stephen because they're guaranteed to come up with points where your immediate response is, it, it gads, how is that even conceivable? So could I just ask Stephen to briefly speculate on how he imagines a language could be debugged using a debugger designed for a different language. Is 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 that at all conceivable or possible? It's already the case, right? It, if um, if you uh, if you start GDB and you you attach to some program that happens, because with GDB you can switch languages, right? So so what you can what you're basically doing is uh, saying to GDB whatever my current language is, let's say my current language is Fortran, I want you to make me a Fortran view of the current program state. And it will do a better or worse job of that. But it's definitely, it's, that's something that falls out of the design. I don't know if that's answered your question. But, but this, is, this appeals to the latent model within, within Unix, right? That was, that was put there in order to enable debugging symbols to be intelligible. Right, it's it's relying on the fact that there is a somewhat language agnostic or a shared meta model in the debugging infrastructure. Yes. Right. Oh, it's, Gary's asking, do I have a headset? Which actually I do. I should have put it on earlier. I'm going to do that now. We'll watch Stephen put his headset on. So in terms of questions, by the way, I've got Pavel next, and I think there's some uh, Rahul in the chat, and then Jeffrey. But we'll wait for our speaker to be connected to audio again. Yeah, um, so do you okay, hear I'm me? Good, I'm good, yep. Yeah, great. So my question relates to the one of the first slides where you mentioned that 
uh, the language is um, that element that always tries to dominate uh, the rest of the of the system, and in that way, the languages are sort of competing by necessity, right? Yep. So um, uh, I, I I would just read the question I wrote it here. If the technical aspect of programming, in the general sense, is about making matter behave, then the languages are not necessarily the only and not the best option how to make major behave. So the question is, could we benefit from a different approach uh, that would um, revisit how we build hardware? Because all, a lot of the discussion is sort of, it gravitates to those languages again and again and again. So like, what, what else is this? Well, there is hardware. So um, I feel that um, perhaps it would be interesting to, um, to learn to see the hardware a little bit more, which is something that uh, software developers uh, are not used to. It's just a given thing, but maybe it would be useful and it would provide some answers. So for example, uh, if we made the hardware um, more work like a general simulator of smart matter or how to call it, some universal matter, then uh, we would be able to sort of more directly attack the, um, the the problem in the sense that we would just have um, something that is a substrate that doesn't really dominate and uh, it would liberate us from how things are being done today because today's processors sort of prefer specific languages and specific approaches. So maybe some liberation is hiding in the uh, re-imagining re of the hardware stuff, like having a processor with a one billion threads, which you can like create um, at will, for example. Um, would that change our thinking somehow? What's your comment on that? This is a great question. I um, I'm a big fan of of thinking about hardware. It's sort of an oblique strategy to. Uh, yeah, to, to think about research problems in software is to say, what happens in hardware? Uh, how are things different there? Uh, you're yeah. a bit ahead of me on uh, exactly how that relates to uh, this whole conviviality angle or the domin. I, part of me wants to answer by saying, I suspect the same problems would come back round again, but um, that's, I have no, I don't even know why I think that. Um, I, I have like crazy um, sort of, images like if every pixel in the screen was a processor then you could like create some uh, sort of user-defined widgets that would live like on the surface of the screen like let's say in every pixel you have a million processors like crazy thing you know and they are efficient and there are no technical um burdens that you have to take uh like um as essentially if we do it in a way that doesn't induce a lot of trade-offs then you as a user could like build some sort of living sets of pixels that would be an overlay over something else in a very literal way and it would be very direct because literally those will be actually executing uh, in the same like uh, in the same place as as the widget is on the play uh, on the screen so then you would it would be very natural to access the data because you would maybe you don't need to actually do it this technical way it's just a, it's a way how to imagine that if it is done on the main cpu and you don't have to like uh the latencies and stuff like that are not an issue in, anymore that it doesn't really matter but the fact is that the latencies and a lot of things are an issue and you cannot for example in windows or linux you cannot create one billion processes you cannot create a process that handles each of the buttons, for example. So these things are very real and very much constraints on what you can do. So maybe a uh, hardware can help lift some of those constraints, a hardware, a different hardware. That's like the idea. And software developers are like, a lot of their knowledge is how to sort of navigate this uh, very nasty space of, of different constraints. Uh, how to still make it work, even if you know, oh, I actually cannot really make a new process every every nanosecond. 
So I have to do very smart workarounds to still make it look as if it works this way. In fact, you have to have, you, you end up with things like thread pools, but these are all techniques. And um, the necessity to learn all those techniques, uh, how to overcome the hardware limitations is something that uh, damages conviviality because it introduces a huge uh, sort of um, uh, barrier to entry. Just some thoughts. Yeah, no, very interesting. I, I can only, I can only give initial reactions to all that. I, I, I suspect that any, whatever the hardware gives you, it will be good at some things and bad at others, and that the the workaround style approaches will, will just move to a different part of the of the system or the experience. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's a pessimistic uh, initial. Uh, that probably just reflects my mood right now. I don't know. It's not a technical <laughs> answer. Great. Um, I think Rahul had a question. Yes, uh, I have a question for Stefan. So if you want to stop, stop building entire worlds of programming languages and libraries, you would still want some fundamental services in your substrate, yes? Stuff like error handling or functions or some sort of data storage, data structures. And at that point, you are essentially uh, asking people to commit to one language in a way, right? It could be, it could be Unix, it could be Smalltalk, it could be self, whatever. But how do you avoid this substrate? Because once the substrate has certain characteristics, even, <clears throat> even the newer projects like Unison Web, right? They enforce a certain worldview on you, right? It's a functional programming language. And I might uh, disagree with the function abstraction itself. So how do you avoid having to create this substrate which limits your worldview to just those things? Um, well, I think, yeah, on, on one level you don't, but uh, obviously you have to pick some set of primitives and that, that has knock on consequences. Um, I think the question is not whether you pick, whether you have to pick such primitives, but it's what primitives you pick, uh, and how they relate to the outside, the inside and outside sort of distinction that, that systems, uh, often have. Um, so I suppose what I'm arguing is the primitives should be more directed at the outside. And this is actually an angle that um, a few years ago I wrote, because one of the few languages that actually does have quite outward directed primitives is C, or any systems programming language in fairness, because you have this notion of memory that is bigger than the process itself, right? You have, you, you have the ability to access, if I have an expression in C that accesses a piece of memory, the compiler doesn't actually know or even care whether that memory is something that was allocated by C code or it came from the outside system. So, so partly um, it's avoiding this kind of denigration of the outside is I think the, the design trick involved. But, but equally, I think you're right to raise the sort of what I'd call the opinionated question, which is that any set of primitives is in a sense opinionated it pushes you a certain way. And again, that, I think the search, the, 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 the holy grail, the high hanging problem as Jonathan would put it, is to come up with ways of, uh, basically to expand our repertoire of primitives in a way that doesn't let go of consensus. If we think of Unix as being the system that took over the world because it generated a lot of rough consensus that everyone could say, yeah, that's roughly sort of a thing we can all work with. And that's why it became this big survivor, had this sort of as Dick Gabriel wrote about, this, these survival characteristics that led it to spread everywhere. Well, what else would have good survival characteristics? You know, how can we, what is it about those primitives that were good, that had these properties that everyone could agree on? And can we think of new ways to stay within that consensus space, but, but somehow improve the, the other properties of the system? That, this all questions, not answers, I'm afraid, but that's the way I think about, about those issues. Thank you. Um, I think Jeffrey, you have the next question. Uh, all right. Um, this might have been partially answered by that last question, but I'm curious to hear Stephen respond to Jonathan's point around uh, building new worlds. And it seems like there's this tension where on the one hand, we want radical new approaches that are very different from what we have today. But on the other hand, if we don't want to build totally new worlds, do you have thoughts on how to reconcile that, especially because I think some of the most interesting new ideas I'm seeing emerging in programming today uh, often tend to be people doing exactly that, building new worlds. And so how do, how do you think about that tension, Stephen? Yeah, great question. Um, 
to, so just to address Jonathan's framing of the issue, are we still early on in the the universe's timeline? Well, well, yes and no. Um, I like to think that we have a long way to go in terms of future progress, uh, because obviously our current technology is is dire. Um, on the other hand, we've already reached a point where um, specific software technologies pervade most aspects of most you know, a large fraction of human beings lives right so in a sense we've we've formed a the, the net has formed um and in that sense we're not we're not early in the universe anymore that that's my sort of definition of of time if you like um so it means that if you if you invent a new world without without framing it as an evolution of the old one then you're you're set yourselves up to either fail or to to dominate right so either um your only tactic at that point is to somehow replace what came before you with this new wonderful thing. And that's exactly, I think Jonathan made my point for me by saying, well, we're seeing a lot of layers stuck on the old stuff. Uh, and that's exactly, that's exactly the reason why. I think this is, we're in violent agreement here, which is to say, um, you can't eliminate the old world because it's already, you know, the net has closed, right? So, so you have to come up with ways of evolving it at a, quite a fine grain rather than building a new clump in one particular point and hoping that that transcends its host and becomes the new life form if to wildly mix metaphors uh you have to worry about how to evolve the host so that it can do whatever the new thing is which now obviously that's not to say it's not a good experimental method to say forget about the old stuff for a while let's just come up with a new thing because that's freeing and that's going to help us imagine new ways of working but then you've got the second part of the problem which is okay how do we get there from here which is to many people less fun so it doesn't get done as much people say oh no i'm just going to take over the world because that's what that's what previous technologies have done but the success stories in terms of taking over the world have happened in an era where the net had not completely closed over human race that's that's my view of that anyway Not to mention the rewards in the academic context for inventing a new world and then setting it aside and inventing another new world for the next paper and that sort of thing. Um, right, yes. It's easier to sell uh, new worlds for various reasons, yeah. Yes. So um, do we have any other questions for Stephen or for Jonathan? Um, if we have if we have time if we have time i i, I have a, a, a so between a statement and a question okay your your audio is um really breaking up so it's hard to hear you maybe if you mute your video that would do it uh is that is that better it seems to be better. Yeah, go go ahead, Gary. Thanks. So I've been I've been doing um, uh, quite a lot of thinking about expressiveness, um, and uh, so it, it occurs to me that 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 the more expressive, the 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 higher powered up in the informal language hierarchy our languages are, the less the less decidable uh, things are. So kind of expressiveness is co-decidability. Um, and uh, to Jonathan's point of you know uh, of 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 how of degrading, um, do we need to do a lot more of our what we call programming uh, of our of our development in far weaker environments? Um, you know, uh, uh, law of of you know principle of least power. Is that a question for me or um, Stephen? Either of you. Either of you. Um, um, you know, do, do we, you know, do we, it, it appears that most of our tooling is at the very expressive side of the world. Um, and do we need to have demarcated tooling at multiple points in the expressiveness? Um, chain uh, so that we are effectively trying to work uh, you know at one at one end we would work deterministically 
um, as far as we could. And when we run out of what we can express deterministically, we would wrap that, you know, we would embed that with something that was non-deterministic and something high, higher up in the expressiveness hierarchy. I think there's a lot to be I'm said for that. To... Oh, yeah. You go, Jonathan. I think you have more to say than I do, probably. Well, what I have to say is I'm going to pull out another quote from your paper, which mm. is that uh, the definition of new abstractions is often perceived as a free operation, or at least an author's prerogative, but it is actually a high cost operation precisely because it is a play at dominating others. So that's my answer for you. Yeah. I'm actually struggling to connect those. Um, uh, well, so the, no, the more expressive I, I features can... are these powerful abstractions, which yep. end up being dominating. So, okay. so um, yeah, it's abstraction and expressibility are, 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 are highly positively correlated. Um, in, in fact, I, I would go so far to my previous statement to say that um, I would I would hold up as um, expressiveness is codicidability as a fundamental theory of computation. Okay, here's another quote that maybe is more direct answer to your question. A tool that allows some individuals to achieve great power is unacceptable if it tends towards domination of the majority even if this domination occurs unintentionally, indirectly, or creepingly. And let's be clear, outside of academia anyway, most of the models that we point to are precisely built for domination scale. So React being the, the great example of, of being, being precisely a tool built in order to manage what a quarter of a million developers at Facebook or whatever uh, to build a system that has a billion users, these kinds of things. So it's it's worth it's worth being willing to be critical of these tools by 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 simply by virtue of the scales that they they propose to to target. I think to just to add a little thought to Gary's question, uh, one of so, so on the one hand, yes, I think I think I can answer yes that there is room for languages of whatever kind that have less expressiveness than Turing powerful, let's say. Uh, that space is a bit hard to characterize. You often end up being Turing, Turing powerful by accident. And also I think that that formal characterization of expressiveness doesn't often get to the heart of well, a more, a more practical sense of, of what, you know, is this language actually expressive in the ways that I want it to be? So it's quite an interesting question exactly of what, what is the overlap there? Like to what extent, maybe the overlap is basically nothing. Like you, you can make a language that is totally useless, uh, but happens to be true and powerful. Um, but that's a somewhat extreme case. I've picked the degenerate case. Uh, yeah, more, more thought needed, but... Um, I think certainly yes, there's room for there's room for such languages, but I don't put too much store by the that way of measuring the expressiveness, if you like. Well, we are now at time, I think. So, um, Stephen or Jonathan, do you want to end with any final words, or shall we shall we go ahead and wrap up for the day? I'm kind of I'll, exhausted, actually. I'll yield um, to Stephen. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening because, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure whether that was going to make any sense or not. I think it's, it's good that it may not have made perfect sense. There's some, some merit in, uh, in not making total sense. But, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. It was a marvelous presentation. And thanks to all of our speakers today. And see you again tomorrow. We have another one today, don't we? Tonight, actually. There's, tonight, there's yeah. another one today. That's right. We've got one more tonight. I, yeah. That's Two more. Two more. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Two more. It's a big day for the more Wait a second, today? No. Let's clarify that. Right, maybe. just one more at three at three p.m. Eastern. It looks like, right? Yeah. See you then. All right. Stop cool. making All right. sense, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>